Sure. So a little bit of the background. We're talking about lupus nephritis, which is involving half or about 60% of all lupus patients. Usually, lupus nephritis develops in the first five years after they are diagnosed. So usually when there is this renal involvement, it's within the first five, six years of disease. Some patients can develop lupus nephritis as the first manifestation. So that's even harder to diagnose because you don't know the person already has lupus. When we know, we monitor them with urine exam. And when there is protein in the urine, you further evaluate them. And we will need a biopsy of the kidney to make sure we know what we're treating. Not only the histological type, because there are different types and different approaches, but also how active or how damaged that kidney is already involved. So if you get a biopsy and it's too late already with scarring, you may decide not to treat. But hopefully we need a fast track when there is protein in the urine and evaluate those patients. One of the features that makes it difficult is that there are not too many symptoms. You can have leg edema, you can have puffy eyes, retention of liquid and edema. You can have high blood pressure, hypertension, but most of the patients are asymptomatic. No clinical manifestation. They can see, oh, my urine is getting uh, colored, like reddish, dark. That's blood in the urine. When there's more protein, it's foamy, like there is soap or detergent in the urine. urine. So that makes you start thinking more of nephritis and the faster you get the biopsy and the result and you're able to treat, the better the results. Now, with the standard therapy that we had until 2020, we were doing better than what we were doing in the 1970s and 80s, but still a big unmet need because despite of treating patients at the proper time when with the current treatments before 2020, there were still about 40% of the patients that will progress to end-stage renal disease, meaning they will need dialysis and if they're lucky, a tra kidney transplant. So it's a huge impact in the quality of life, in socioeconomic burden. Of course, they, they need to go to emergency room, hospitalizations, so high cost, high impact for them. In 2020, there was a, a study that was published at the New England Journal of Medicine called Bliselen, where we studied Benlista or Belimumab on top of the standard of care compared to the standard of care alone, so controlled with placebo for Benlista. And that study demonstrated after two years of follow-up that the patients that were given Benlista on top of the standard therapy had better outcomes. So they improved the inflammation faster and more frequently. And also they were less likely to progress to end-stage kidney disease. So we are, with this new treatment, reducing the risk of having this mostly young people going into the need of dialysis and transplant. Based on this evidence, the KDGO, which is a group of nephrology experts international, they call the Kidney Disease Global Outcomes Group, and they publish guidelines every four or five years. So this that was published this year, January, it's the most recent ones where they incorporate the suggestion to use belimumab or Benlista early in the treatment of lupus nephritis of patients with the class three or four. With that, they are showing and their support to the data that was found in the study and demonstrating that if you do add this treatment right in the initial phase, you're less likely to have relapses, meaning new flares of the 
inflammation in the kidney and you're more likely to preserve the kidney function. So protecting the kidney from the damage caused by um, this dreadful disease. It's a paradigm shift because before we were using non-selective immune suppressors and those which are similar to what's used in oncology to treat cancer, but lower dose for longer duration. So with that, we were able to improve the results when compared to steroids, cortisone alone, but still more infections, bone marrow, um, depletion of the bone marrow, production of new cells. There is one of the treatments that causes ovarian failure. So the high risk of infertility for a young woman, we don't want that. So adding Benista early and then using also for a longer maintenance period, we are sparing the patient from the exposure to more and more steroids, prednisone, and their side effects. We are reducing the risk of the damage, as I said, and also reducing the risk of new relapses. We know that all our, us humans have our kidneys programmed to live 100, 120 years. So if we get to reach 100 years of age, you, we will have some type some form of kidney failure because of aging. When there is a lupus nephritis flare, this person, if not treated properly, loses 10 to 20% of their kidney cells. That means 10 or 20 years of lifespan. So every time there is a new flare that we call relapses, there is this damage in the kidney that is irreversible. Once the glomeruli tissue is dead, there's no replacement. Fortunately, we have two kidneys, we have many glomeruli, but having three flares, four flares, we reduce the lifespan of that kidney in 40, 50 years. So that means if that happened at a young age, this person, when they reach 40, 50 years of age, will be going on dialysis. And I mean, you would know the impact of dialysis in, in the whole system, in the person's life, in their quality of life, the whole family of a person with dialysis is involved because it's very limiting. I think it's a great impact because it helps the, the guidelines are designed for physicians to follow but also it's used by payers, by authorities that will standardize treatments. So it, it makes it official. So it's bringing the evidence to clinical practice and suggesting the best pathways for patients. So of course, the patients and their families will be having great benefit of this new guidelines because it endorses this, this treatment, and hopefully we will have less patients with lupus going on the end-stage kidney disease and needing dialysis and transplant. I mean, it's already there. It's a big uh, start. Of course, um, we still need more data. We need to learn better who are the patients more likely to benefit from the new treatments. And there are also new uh, targets being studied. So it's the beginning of a new era, but it's still not the end of the new era. It's uh, more of a targeted therapy where we know in the complex mechanism of the disease that involves the immune system, specifically targeted therapy tailored to um, 
cytokines to agents that are important in the pathogenesis of the disease. But we know lupus is not one single disease. It's not all patients are the same. So there are several interesting targets to be um, tackled. Bliss, which is the target that Belista blocks, is very important in the B cell activation. And the B cells are the ones that produce those autoantibodies. So we are learning more about the disease mechanism and knowing how to break this chain that if we let it go, will be continuously causing damage. And we know that the damage when present predicts further damage and early mortality. So we want to avoid that. We want our patients to live longer and with a better quality of life. No, I mean, I would like to thank all the patients and their families that were involved in the studies, all the physicians and healthcare providers that were also dedicated to do those trials because without the evidence, we wouldn't be able to be here today. We wouldn't have those guidelines. It takes more than a village. It's a lot of effort. I mean, when you read the paper and you see a table and a graph, it looks simple, but to get there, it involves so many people, time. And if we didn't have those people volunteering to be on the trial, and the support from their families and the whole healthcare team provider that is involved, we wouldn't be offering our people living with lupus better options for treatments.